My name is John Lovell. I teach architecture at Pratt Institute in Brooklyn, New York. I blog at johnlovell.com, review movies from a mythological point of view at cinemadiscourse.com, and you can reach me at johnlovell at macmac.com. This is a lecture on Chinese architecture for a course in graduate architecture on non-Western architecture. And the approach here is not to look at the architecture so much as to look at the mythological and symbolic structure of the culture and then see how that is reflected in the architecture. I'm working in this course with a notion. We'll talk about where the theory comes from toward the end of the course. But it's influenced by the thoughts of uh, Oswald Spengler and Decline of the West and the notion that a high culture begins by laying down its temple form and its epic poem. And we'll talk more about that, but the epic poem sort of describes the moral structure of the culture and the temple form sort of the physical space in which the culture can move. We've looked at India and seen in Arjuna and the Buddha, the notion of the restrictions in this life and then one's relationships to reincarnation. And in the Buddha stupa, the sort of layers of consciousness. Next week is Islam, which is a Middle Eastern culture, part of one of the biblical tradition. There one puts oneself in conformity with the rules of a creator and Later, we'll look at the West and do a little bit of contrasting with Greece, which I'm regarding as a different culture from, from Western Europe. And today, we'll look at China. So, China is a cultural region, an ancient civilization, and a national or multinational entity. It's one of the world's oldest continuous civilizations. China is not that old compared to, say, Egypt or something like that. Ancient Egypt is not continually with us to this day, and China is. World's longest continuously used written language system. And I'm going to make some references to Joseph Needham, who's a scholar of China, and refers to the four great inventions of China as paper, the compass, gunpowder, and printing. So the a strong defining feature of China is that we start with the high steps of Himalayas and Tibet, and then we step down into fertile plains. So look at the amount of water in here. And so from this comes a feature that we're going to see in the architecture. The north is negative, the south is positive. North is bad, south is good. Because north is where it's cold, windy, hostile, and it's where invading barbarians come from. And south is where this, it's sunny and fertile. There's in China, unlike the West, a deep-seated desire to live in harmony with nature as opposed to the Western notion of conquering nature. Now, both live with in their natural environments. Both harvest their crops both are able to feed themselves. But conceptually, we can understand a dragon as symbolic of earth energies. And in the West, we slay the dragon. The young male adolescent hero slays the dragon and then marries the maiden. And every male hero slain dragons, right? Hercules slays the hydra. St. Patrick drives the snakes out of Ireland, on and on. They're all slaying dragons. In China, the dragon is a symbol of good fortune and is very much revered. So a totally different attitude toward these earth energies. In Chinese planning and architecture, some of the principles, in effect, are geomancy, the Ming Tang and Yin and Yang. We'll describe each of those. And other influences are Taoism, Confucianism, and Buddhism, which we'll look at briefly, but we have discussed now uh, quite a bit. So the Ming Tang is a legendary mansion of the Son of Heaven. 
and it's a monolith. It's got four gates, it's geometrically concentric circles and squares, and it has to do with the orientation. And remember, the stars are very important to all cultures before electricity, because they could see them, <laughs> unlike us today. So this heavenly mansion is identified with a polar star and, it, and the center of the universe. Everything revolves around it. This is a time-lapse photograph looking at the North Star, and therefore the other stars are revolving around it through the night. And it's a prototype for palaces, capital cities, and royal temples. Now, there's a Catholic figure, St. Teresa of Avalon. That's the one that you see in Bernini's sculpture in ecstasy as she's being pierced through the heart by an angel with a golden arrow. And she wrote a book called St. Teresa's Castle, and she describes a vision in which there are a series of concentric palaces, and in the center on the throne was Christ. It's a mandala. <laughs> it's the exact same thing. India, China, Europe, this heavenly mandala persists. Geomancy, geo is earth, mancy, divination, or feng shui, which means wind water. So you might have heard of feng shui. You can get a book about using feng shui to make your apartment more harmonious, arranging your bedroom for a better love life, arranging your desk where you pay your bills for a better economic prosperity. And the section of this, like a shelf this wide of feng shui books in Barnes and Noble. But actually in China, it's something what I just described is kind of a popularization that derives from a Chinese discipline. But in China, it's quite elaborate. And so a Feng Shui master is very expensive, has elaborate tools, and will do a total analysis of a site. Now, what are they analyzing? Well, if you imagine acupuncture as a form of medicine, the theory in acupuncture, they, they stick needles in it. And anybody ever had any acupuncture? Okay, so the needles are extremely thin and they don't hurt. And, you, and when they, you know, you don't see any blood or anything. Now, anybody know what the acupuncturist is doing or supposed to be doing? Why is, what is this? Why do you do this? So you press on the base of your foot for your liver. But this, this, this spot on your, on your foot will fix your liver. Right, so yeah. Well, the idea is as follows. There are various kinds of energies moving through your body. And you could, you could specify them if you want to, but just in sim sim simple terms. Disease is blockage of the proper flow of those energies. It's either going too fast or too slow, but it's not flowing properly. The needle repairs the proper flow of the energy. The needle causes the energies to now flow properly. Now, you know, you can, that's very general. And I think any acupuncturist would agree with what I just said. Now, more specifically, they might have more elaborate theories, but there are flows of energy in your body. Your illness is caused that they are not proper. The needles fix them. Feng Shui or geomancy has the same attitude toward the earth. There are energies flowing in the earth. If you put your building in the wrong place, in the wrong orientation, those energy is going to be flowing through there and screw up your life and screw up your marriage and screw up the finances of your company and you don't want to get that wrong. So that's the theory. So you get a geomancer to this day, any major building built in Chinese culture, could be in China, could be in Taiwan, could be in Hong Kong. If a Chinese company is building a headquarters in San Francisco, they will get a geomancer. And if for no other reason, if everybody in the company doesn't believe this, thinks it's a, all baloney, they might have a client who believes it. So they tell that client, we did it properly. That sound right? <laughs> okay. So amusingly, when IMPE did the Hong Kong Shanghai Bank, he deliberately did it, everything against geomancy. Because he says, I hate this superstition, and I'm not going to. I'm not going to have anything to do with it. But that's the theory. There are natural flows of energy in the earth, and your building should work in harmony with those flows and not in disharmony with them. 
You don't want bad energy throwing in your, through your building. You don't want to block something important, uh, whatever. So the attitude toward the landscape. This is an exaggeration, but we're going to take this as typical of a Chinese and a Western painting. And so there are people and architecture in this painting. We just have to look twice before we see them. Here are the people, some guys on donkeys. Here's a little temple. There's a person in this one too. We can't miss it. <laughs> and there's a landscape too, but it's definitely subordinated to the human being. So in the West, the human being comes forward, is central, is the most important thing. In China, the human being is integral with nature. Now, even if the people were in the distance, a Claude Lorraine French landscape, the people would still metaphysically pop in the Western painting. They would be done with a different attitude in the brushstroke that makes them pop forward. I mean, this is just obvious. <laughs> this is just hugely up front. But even when it's not so much the case in the Western art, the human beings are central. Here, it's all integrate. Here's another one. Here's a human being in nature, but the quality of the brush strokes are not that much different than they are for the nature. Okay, Geomancy and a Korean house. So hills to the north, water flows to the south. Here's our house. We put our back against the north and we open up to the south. Yin yang. So this is a yin yang symbol. And there's a notion that we experience the world, and then they, we also say the world exists, shall we say, as pairs of opposites. So there's dark light, male, female, wet, dry, etc. Rather than saying one is good and one is bad, one should be avoided. Chinese philosophy sees that these pairs of opposites, fast, slow, soft, hard, are in continual flow one into the other, and there's a little bit of one in the other. It's a little bit of masculineness in women, a little bit of femaleness in men. All qualities are in continuously flowing interrelationship. So that's the yin-yang principle of opposing complementary energies. So we start with our four-quartered walled home or city, gates in four quarters. Symmetry about a north-south axis. This is showing uh, symmetry across the east-west axis as well, but you're going to see it gets modified when built. Now, they also have systems, which we find in many cultures, that each of the directions are associated with an element. So north is water, east is wood, south is fire, west is uh, metal. Each is associated with a color, each is associated with a quality. An interesting feature in Chinese orientation there are five directions, northeast, southwest, center. And we say, wait a minute, <laughs> center's not a direction, center's a point where you stand to be oriented. Yeah, if you have a Western abstract notion of space, but that's not their notion of space. Center's a place, happens to be where the imperial palace is, in the center of the world, you know, in China, which is the most important country. There's also a concentric bias, so traditional ethnic Chinese worldview, dating from the fifth century, sees the imperial center surrounded by royal domains, surrounded by, surrounded by tributary feudal princes and lords. These are the ones that you've conquered, and these are your guys. These are the ones you've conquered and they pay tribute. This is a zone of pacification. These are people we've stomped. Uh, but they're not part of the system. They're just no longer a threat. Zone of allied barbarians. Okay, so these are the barbarians, 
but they'll work with us. And then the zone of cultural savagery, in other words, us. <laughs> That's the rest of the world. So this is the Chinese worldview, which sees there's nothing important outside of China. And here we see a um, plan of Chen'an in the um, seventh century. And so we have our four quarters. Remember how we lay out a town in India? If you understand the, how the Etruscans lay out their towns, exactly the same. We get our wall, our four quarter, our, our, our quarters, our center, our four gates. And then it gets modified with the center moved up here so that we, our back is to the north and we're open to the south. Okay, the traditions, Confucianism, and we've gone through that. So Confucianism is social and moral codes. Tells everybody how to act, what their obligations are to everybody else. And Taoism, so it's, it's spelled with a T and pronounced with a D, Taoism. However, I looked it up, in, looking it up on Wikipedia, now has it spelled with a D. So these things change, like, what's Peking? It's Beijing, it's a previous name. <laughs> it was about 30 years ago, Peking became Beijing. So how the West chooses transliteration, how we choose to translate these terms are occasionally changed. So Taoism is uh, by a legendary figure, Lao Tzu, and uh, influences naturalness and spontaneity of uh, Chinese landscape architecture and painting, and seeks to put one in harmony with the principles of nature. Not just nature, uh, the, the Taoism is the way, and it's the way of all things. It's the way, it's how the universe works. So we would call that the grand unified field theory. <laughs> we think everything works by physics, that's our mystical system, and the ultimate science is grand unified field theory. It's when you get all of science working in one big theory and explains the universe. So the way is the principle of how the universe works. So in, um, this is, a, my favorite translation is Fuang in English. And actually you can get that in PDF. I should have looked for that PDF when I printed this out. But the way that can be, the Tao that can be told is not the eternal Tao. And then, ever desire less, one can see the mystery. Ever desiring, one can see the manifestations. The two are the same. It's just we experience them differently. And then, one of the famous chapters, Frank Lloyd Wright has a quote from this on the wall at Tarius and West. Clay is formed into a vessel. It is because of its emptiness that the vessel is useful. So the useful part of the vessel is not the walls. You can't put any water in the walls. The water goes in the emptiness. So when they talk about emptiness, it has these implications. It's the part that's useful. And so it doesn't simply mean nothing. Just like Taoist inaction doesn't mean taking a nap. Uh, it means acting in a way that is in harmony so, that, so as to be more effective. So Frank Lloyd Wright took from this. Now, Wright's take on Beaux-Arts architecture was not fair. I mean, he was in revolt against it, so. But to just sort of exaggerate it in Wright's terms, look at the front of the 42nd Street Library or the Metropolitan Museum. 
So there's this wall with arches and vaults and columns and things on top. And what else so hung up about the wall? It's the space inside that's important. So Wright would say, I don't care about the molding and the frame and, you know, this is, it, it's this that's important. This is what we move through. And he sees himself in that position in harmony with um, uh, the Tao Te Ching. His experience was through Japan, but same idea. Buddhism comes into China. It's a long, continual story. And I mentioned the story of uh, monkey. So the book is Journey to the West. And so these Chinese monks are going to India, which is west of China, to get sacred texts. And so Buddhism actually continually, over long periods of time, come to China. It's interesting, you take something like Buddhism in China, and we're talking about maybe a thousand years. <laughs> it'll come, there'll be several schools that have wiped out, they'll come again, and it'll be more sophisticated. Same thing in Tibet. There's several comings of Buddhism to Tibet. And, that, and now it's been obliterated by the Chinese. And look at the world today. Look at, for example, the relationship between uh, the West, or say, the United States and China right now. How is that going to be seen 100 years from now? In other words, this is not it. <laughs> it's a process that goes on for decades and maybe centuries. And so same thing with Buddhism in China. There, it doesn't, there isn't a point where Buddhism comes to China. There is a continual process of many kinds. OK, architecture. We're in architecture school. Characteristics of Chinese architecture. We start with a podium of grand earth, grand earth podium. So you pound the earth and get it hot. Okay. Then, stone bases. You have these flat pieces of stone. You place them on the earth. The next is the columns. Now, why would you want to put the columns on stone and not on the earth? Two reasons. Pardon? It's more stable. It won't sink in. It's a footing, in a way. It's another reason. The, the uh, trunk of a tree is like a straw. It's just going to sh soak water up, and then it will rot. So this keeps it away from the moisture on the ground. Then we get a wood frame roof, which can be quite elaborate. And it's not trusses. They are spans. And then tile and or thatch roof. And then finally, most important, non-structural, non-bearing walls. Now I'm going to jump ahead. This has become, this is true in Japan as well. And this is going to become very influential on the modern architects. Structural frame, non-bearing wall. It's Barcelona, by the way. It's Corbu. Five points to it in, toward a new architect. Columns and non-bearing wall. And it shows, Corbu shows the walls curving, meaning you can put it anywhere you want because it doesn't have any structural responsibilities. So this is a real turn-on for the modern architects for this clarity. OK, our example is uh, Beijing, Forbidden City, palace complex in the center. When I grab this satellite view, I didn't realize you can turn off all the spots that are indicating where there are photographs. There's dots all over the place. But there's a way to turn that off. So it's imperial palace from the mid-Ming dynasty to the end of the Qing dynasty. It's in the middle of Beijing, and it's now a museum. And it's huge, 800 buildings, and like many of the things we're seeing, it's a World Heritage Site, declared by UNESCO. So, a moat, this is water, our four gates, our main palaces here, and then, so, our back to the north, open courtyards, to the south. 
and then a, in quotes, natural river flowing through here, very deliberately, you know, it's like Central Park. It's like, isn't it wonderful that we left that piece of nature in the middle of Manhattan and had that beautiful natural, it's all human made. <laughs> every hill, every clump of trees was all designed and put there to look natural. It's the English garden tradition. Same thing here and same thing in Japan. And same principle as a house invasion. The Imperial buildings have gold or yellow roofs. So, back to the north, open courtyards to the south. Here's Tiananmen Square in front of the Hall of Harmonies, Hall of Supreme Harmony. So here's our columns. Now, interesting, this is a royal palace built in wood. Given the amount of labor available, they could have built in stone, but wood is preferred because of its natural qualities. Here's parts of our river going through here. Harmony with nature. A little temple of heaven, domes are domes of heaven. Is a heavenly dome. And the incredible richness of ornament, and what do we see all over the place here? Dragons everywhere. Dragons everywhere. So, totally auspicious. You would never find this in the West.